All right, so those were my plant sets for the bow drill. We're gonna go over all of my wood sets now. And uh, what I'm gonna do, because I have so many sets, is I'm gonna combine uh, the review of the 22 variables for the bow drill along with the principal factors, all those little things like troubleshooting, upgrade complications, all those things we need to go over through the 22 variables. Um, we're going to do one per set to kind of mix things up and uh, move things along. So I've been, I've been doing this for a long time, like uh, over about almost 30 years. And uh, so it's, it's in a way it's a lot like martial arts. You can't really teach this stuff uh, in a linear fashion very well. Um, it's very piecemeal, it's like a quilt, you know, it's like, uh, it's very mosaic. And uh, so you have to keep going over stuff and stuff crosses over and sometimes you have to back up and so because there's so much to these things and it's all important that you have as much information about how all this stuff works as possible. So, uh, our first one is going to be need, and we're going to do a set of pie. All right, here we go. All right, so we're going over need of the bow drill as the first variable we need to review. Um, so in a way, a lot of things improve across the board. Uh, we're answering our if only questions. If only we could get more pressure. If only we can get more speed. If only we can get more rotations. If only we can have more reliability. Well, you get that through the bow drill. So a lot of things improve. In fact, uh, the majority of the variables do improve. They increase. And uh, which makes this uh, method really wonderful. Um, if only I could use uh, a thicker spindle, because with the hand drill and the mouth drill, the spindles have to be thinner for you to be able to uh, rotate them using your hand surface area. Well, you can get much larger surface area diameter uh, pieces going with the bow drill method so it's always a big uh, it's a big plus this method all around um, it's a wonder it's it's not a it's not surprising that some people only use the bow drill method all the time and don't do other methods because the bow drill can be uh, so much easier to use so our example is going to be pine uh, everything is mated. This is lumber pine. Okay, um, you've seen this board before, and uh, so this this spindle is made from a piece of lumber, and it's already mated, as you can see. You can see that the base end it's burned up over the edge. Okay, our brace end is greased. Now our pressure hand braces are some various things that I've picked up through the years. Um, this is a pine, a knot of pine, and it has two brace socket holes in them. And you can see it has that uh, 
it's shaped very well to the hand and I try to keep the hole near the wrist area of the palm so if I hold it this way the point is down I can hold it this way where the round edge fits into the crease of the palm and it fits this way either way I can get my I get a good finger curl around it even and it is round so it makes it a little harder to tell which uh, uh, how to keep it perpendicular and stuff like that but again it's it's through feel and, and it is experience here's an old gnarly knot which we threw a uh, socket hole in and uh, this is how when uh, things start kind of crossing over into like art forms you know you find a piece of driftwood you just think something just seems to have character and you just use something like that uh, this piece of uh, pine is naturally grew uh, flat it's got a few um, knots in it but uh, it forms well to the hand and you can get your fingers around it really well it has just enough that negative surface area to you can just get a good grip on it and the uh, socket hole is near the, the wrist area of the palm good piece now this one this was a section of lumber that uh, I had found and as you can see the the growth rings on it okay the center of the this um, section piece which was sawn cut uh, on one side right where the center of the growth rings is that's where I chose to put the uh, socket hole and again I've got a lot of good negative surface area where I can get my fingers around and the socket hole is near the wrist area of the palm and this one's really flat okay so uh, I can ha have a better idea of uh, the perpendicular flatness of it when I'm holding it all right so we're gonna light this set up now I'm just gonna use a card for our coal transfer device I'm gonna get in position have my towel under my knee And we're going to use the flat one in this case. We're going to use the large rattan bow. And we're going to use, we're pretty much going to use store bought cord unless I specifically kind of say so. I got the notch toward you. All right. And I'm not going to use a shoe. Get it warmed up. Nice long strokes. It's the whole cord. And my arm braced against my leg. I'm going to use a little bit more speed, more rotations. More speed, more pressure. And we got a big, huge coal. But this time I didn't even flatten the uh, bottom. Although I probably could have. But I kind of knew that this wouldn't be too, too bad. All right. Okay. Lumber pine. All right, so our next one is uh, reason in our variables list. And uh, 
One of the things that I want to remind you to do is to uh, really keep a good uh, journal and record. Uh, keep an archive of the things that you're doing. The woods that you're using, the plants, the materials, the dates, uh, especially what is the core to, um, the base and the spindle, and the tools that you use especially, um, problems you ran into. Uh, make sure you're you're jotting down notes that you you think are going to be important later, especially Because this is kind of a lineage thing You want to be passing these things on to other people as well So you don't want to forget those things. I mean you earn that lesson if you got a fail or a success You got something out of that. So it's important to pass that along and uh, help people with their struggles when they're learning this science and art later on. One of the problems you can run into, like I had said earlier, is sometimes you'll accidentally, for whatever reason, put your brace end into your base hole and your base hole gets greased unfortunately. So if you stick your base end into your base hole now, both of them end up being greased and this ends up being like pressure brace and and brace end and now you have two and you don't want that because um, now you've gotten rid of your your pH friction so uh, some of the things you can do is uh, if you happen to have like a gritty sand that has no moisture in it uh, you could throw uh, some pinches of that in there and work that in you know using your bow and spin that in there and that acts like uh, like a sandpaper in there and grinds everything down takes everything off um, without it really having to burn uh, another thing you can do is really just take a file or a little bit of sandpaper okay or your knife and you just get in there and you just start scraping everything down as best you can okay and uh, try to remove that surface that has the oil on it the other thing you're gonna have to do too is make sure you do the same with not just the base hole but if you accidentally stuck your your base end in there too you have to take the oil off there again or you're gonna reapply that oil in there again accidentally and it's gonna just spin again so make sure that both surfaces, the base end and the base hole, have no oil in them. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Now with uh, recording and archiving, you're going to see some f past photos of me having done these kits. And uh, as you can see, there's a card next to them with the dates, what happened, what the materials are. And uh, you could be much neater about it than I was. <laughs> hint, hint. But uh, I get all mad scientists and I just start, you know, making a mess. But uh, again, clean up. And because uh, it's in your best interest, it's in everybody's best interest. So uh, you have to problem solve things and you have to head problems off at the pass. So one of the things you could really do to head problems off at the pass is uh, keep a record of things to help uh, remind you of things that you've done and uh, so you can keep going and move on from there and not make the same mistakes over again if you can help it. So our core two devices now are Douglas fir. The base, which is very small, so I'm going to wear a shoe. And uh, this spindle, which measures about five and a half inches and less than half an inch in diameter. It's already been mated, and I flattened the end to remove that dead space center. Uh, and my pressure hand brace is going to be a branch of elm. Okay, that I happen to have. It's completely round 
which makes it a little harder for me to figure out which is perpendicular or not, but I can get my hand around it very well. And uh, it's nice and comfortable. So we're going to give this one a shot. My bow is bamboo, uh, a smaller bow of bamboo, because the diameter of the spindle is is smaller. And remember, you can with the wood spindles, you can just push them down. Unlike the plant spindles, where you have to bend your bow, bend your bow, loosen the cord. And then from the base end down, put the spindle on. Here, you hold the cord, touch the spindle to the cord, dive the brace end down toward your fingers, and wrap with this hand. Then grab the base of the handle of the bow and snap it on with the tension. Then with the cord, and the spindle together, you grab that and hold that and pick up your push your hand brace. Okay? Now you're ready to get into position. See how small this base is? I really need my shoe to hold that down. Alright. Lock everything against my leg. Oh, that's why you don't let the pressure up. Get in position again. See this cord hanging off here? We're going to wrap that around so that's not in our way. Use the whole cord, long strokes. Plenty of pressure, plenty of speed, plenty of rotations. You got a nice bolt. <sighs> Here's an excellent example of drift, too, if you could see that. See, we started here. And it actually started moving toward the notch because there's space there. Uh, the spindle wants to move toward the space where there's less resistance. So you can see it drilled right into the notch. But All right, so our next variable is skills. So this is really based on uh, what you know up to this point from past experience, your knowledge, and what you're bringing to the table and what you're able to do. So uh, basically you're thinking to yourself, can I do this? Do, do I know this? Do I not know it? And uh, when it comes to uh, life supporting skills, that's really a very important question to ask yourself. I know when I'm in the emergency room, uh, when I work, uh, when something hap when something comes up, when something happens uh, that's new, one of the, the first question I ask myself really is, do I know this or, or don't I? So because probably the three most important words in the emergency room that you could say that's truthful are I don't know so if you know you're working and you're saving people's lives and you don't know something you can't pretend that you do so and you have to be honest with yourself it's, it's not just a matter of um, 
um, being a matter of pride and ego and losing face, it would be more important and more respectful and uh, lives won't be lost if you could just let people know that uh, you don't understand something or you don't know what this is or you've never seen it before or um, because then people have information to act on to save other people's lives. So same thing here, but you have to be honest with yourself. Have I seen this before? Have I not seen it before? Um, I'm not sure if I can figure this out. Maybe I need help. Um, I'm going to keep trying until I get some understanding of it. So that's why uh, the, the fact that you have to keep going and persevere through these things is, is important. So, As Sensei uh, said when I was in Japan to me, you kind of have to make your own luck. And how you do that is with uh, skill building. Build your skills up, build your awareness up, and your luck increases. Too bad you can't do that for a lottery ticket, but your luck will increase. Um, again, right or left-handed. Here's an interesting exercise you should try at home, and that is if you're right-handed, try it left-handed a couple times, and vice versa. So, and uh, it uh, really brings some things into light as to uh, your position, how you're doing things, where you're holding your hand, where your leg is, and uh, kind of getting a more ambidextrous feel, kind of seeing the other side of yourself uh, could be a little enlightening for you. I recommend you give it a try. Um, make sure that you're identifying your, your base end and your brace end. What I like to do is actually write, since I want to identify the material as well, I'll write the name in a circle around the top of the spindle. So here this is a spindle of basswood, which is what we're going to do next. Basswood base, basswood pressure hand brace, basswood spindle, and I have the word basswood written all the way around the top of the dowel, top of the spindle. So that's usually a good trick. Since you want to identify it anyway, and you want to identify the top, the brace end, just do both at the same time. And use a permanent black Sharpie. Do that one. All right. Um, now in skills, we're also talking away about you figuring out your techniques. Um, it's important that once you get a coal, that you don't rush with it. Okay, take your time with it. First of all, it's it's oxidizing, it self-oxidizes. When a coal truly takes off, it starts to grow on its own. But you kind of have to let it, you know, it's just give it a little air. It has fuel. If it needs more fuel, just throw a little bit more coal extender around it without destroying it. But uh, it'll take off on its own as long as it has the three things, as long as it has air, fuel, and it maintains its temperature. So all you have to do is just make sure it's inside the tinder bundle to get your, your fire started. But you have time, so take your time to handle it carefully. It's better that you take the time to handle it carefully and not drop it and destroy it than to have to do everything all over again, right? But uh, in a way, it's uh, a coal is kind of like watching a cigarette or a cigar burn down However, how much fuel it has is how long it's going to live. So the more fuel you have, the longer it'll live. But uh, either way, you have like enough time to be able to get to blow that tinder bundle into flame, provided your tinder bundle is of the correct size and consistency. Uh, but that takes practice as well to kind of get that down and get a feel for it. All right. Um, so when you're bowing, okay, the other thing too is, is that you're not pushing, you're not bending your arm, pulling this way and pushing like this with your bicep and your tricep. When you're bowing, if you could see, it's actually going from the shoulder. Your arm stays straight 
and this is kind of like a bar, your arm. So it doesn't go like this, it's not this way, it's actually like this, it goes across. But you also need to keep the bow level, so your hand adjusts that the bow stays level and perpendicular so that it doesn't go like this. Because in the chordal write up, you want to bend only at the wrist so that the bow goes straight across. Okay, and this is a braced straight. Okay, so it's not this. This will zap your energy. Okay, and you don't want to do that. Just from the shoulder. So using these shoulder muscles, these major muscles up here. Okay, just keep that in mind. Make sure everything is mated well. That's an important skill thing. That everything is mated well. So your your socket in your brace needs to be really nice and deep so that even if it tilts a little bit it's not going to go flying like you saw before which is what happens and uh, so everything needs to be burnt up past the edge of the cylinder okay so and same on the brace end so that when you flatten this like I did here because it's sphered my basswood when I put it back in the hole, the hole is set so well that even though I cut the bottom off, it still fits. See that? It doesn't go anywhere. Okay, it doesn't slide out of the hole. That's how you know it's well mated, even when you flatten it. That it sits still inside the circumference of the hole. Okay? Very important. Uh, what else? So, um, this position of being in the, um, doing your bowling, in Japanese it's called uh, shiko, and in a way a lot of times we, we actually move from this position. So, you'll be on your toes like this, okay, you can say. When you're sitting in, the, this is the seiza, okay, where you're resting on your insteps. This is kiza, which is dangerous position. Seiza is proper sitting. Kiza is called dangerous sitting. And I kind of think it means that you're, you're ready for danger, because you're ready to just get up. Because you have a harder time getting up from seiza because first you have to be on your toes to get up. So from Kiza, you're already on your toes, so you're ready to get up in case danger happens. This is from martial arts. So from Kiza, all you have to do is lean to one side. See that? I'm leaning to my right here. Just a little bit, very subtly, which takes the weight off one leg and you pick that up, okay? Same thing this side, if I go to the left, it takes the weight off this side, I could just pick my foot up just like that. So, in leaning forward and doing my sliding, okay, this is the position for the, for the bow drill. Now, but everything needs to be at 90 degrees. So your ankle, your knee, your hip here and your knee down here okay and uh, we'll move like that across the mat in martial arts and that's called shiko or knee knee movement in Japanese so, all right so our next example our next wood is going to be basswood. All right. And I'm going to take my shoe off for this one. Our set is already mated. Okay. It's flattened. 
So we're going to do this going this way. I have the notch toward you. Okay. We're going to use our card again. And you're going to see me do my straight arm bowing this way as an example. Again we take the spindle, put it to the cord, this hand tucks it around, we go to the back of the bow and we lock it. Okay, That'll sit in there. The arch of my foot is about an inch away. I have the socket hole near my wrist area of my palm. That's locked. A couple good starting strokes, nice and long. Okay. It's smoking, so a little bit of speed, more rotations. I'm using the whole cord. You have time. Okay, so we're going to bow this way. And uh, I have the notch toward you for our basswood sets. Everything's already mated. Okay, again, we're using the bamboo bow. All right, again, we touch the spindle to the cord, the other hand puts that on, we go to the back of the bow, pop that on, grab the string and the spindle together, pick up the pressure hand brace in the other hand. I'm not going to use a shoe this time. My arch is about an inch away from the hole. Okay, Got plenty of space here to bow. All right, So we're going to start off with some Easy strokes. It's smoking already, so it's warming up. So we're gonna a little bit more speed, more rotations. Okay, it's going good. Take your time, let it form. Give it air. There's enough fuel. Let it oxidize so its temperature rises on its own. Okay. And there's our glow. And that's bass. Core two. Base and spin. All right, so our next section is um, means and resources. So one of the things I want to mention 
is uh, when you are burning in your pressure hand brace, okay, when you're setting this with your brace end, okay, you have to make sure that it's really, really well socketed. Now, this starts off uh -huh. as a point, okay, to kind of get this as really as deep as possible, right? But the thing is, is that you don't really want to keep it at a point once it's really in there because that's really a focal point. So you kind of keep burning it and burning it until it really gets rounded. So it's more like a ball and socket joint. It really shouldn't be a point still in there too much. Um, because what that can do is that can make that start burning again, actually, if you're not careful. And you want this really deeply set so that if there's a, a shoulder, here is like a shoulder, where the cylinder meets the round top of the brace end, you have to make sure that that's burned past that point right there to make sure that's really well socketed. So, as deep as you can get this, so um, if this tilts at all, okay, it's still going to sit in there because you're not going to be able to keep that perfectly 180 degrees flat anyway. So the deeper it is, the better off you're going to be. The more uh, well socketed it is, the more it's going to be able to ride. See, when this thing tilts too, because the sec uh, surfaces are round, it's able to ride. But if this is pointed in here, it's not really going to be able to ride. It's going to start focusing friction, FR friction, into a certain area, and it's going to start burning again. So we don't want that. So make sure it's uh, nice and round, brace end, well deeply socketed past uh, the shoulder of the where the round uh, sphering meets the cylinder and you should be all set. So try and keep that in mind. The other thing too is your spindle should be as cylindrical as possible. Okay, Your brace end and your base end, everything in between, this needs to be like a perfect cylinder. So it shouldn't look like a cone and it shouldn't look like uh, a spearhead or something diamond-like, okay? It should be a perfect cylinder throughout and the only change, the only variance should be the long roundness of the brace end and the short shallow base end, okay? Because what this will do is this will really affect how the cord rides up and down and it won't be even. So to keep a sense of uh, evenness throughout, this should be a perfect cylinder the entire length of the spindle, all right? Other means and resource stuff we're gonna do now. Now let's say you have a hardwood um, piece that you're going to make a pressure hand brace device out of. Now it may be really tough to get a hole started inside that piece of hardwood. So um, aside from digging out a hole with your knife or drilling a hole, one of the things you can do is get coals from your fire, okay? You get coals from your fire, like this one here, and you coal burn a hole into your pressure hand brace. And what you do is you hold a small coal in place with a stick and you can use your reed, your hollow tube, like if uh, you saw Jacob blowing on the tinder bundle with it. And you hold it in place and you blow through the reed. and you burn yourself a hole. Okay. Now, what happens is the coal makes the wood catch fire 
and then you scrape out the char. And you start to get a hole, okay? And what you do is you just keep going. Grab another coal from your fire. This one's still good. Put that in there. Get your reed tube. And what? Grab another one. Just the same. If you don't have a pair of chopsticks, you could use a pair of tongs. Now you have to use a really small coal. I'm using a bigger one, just as an example. But because your brace hole can't be too huge, right? As you can see, the wood starts to catch fire. And you take the coal off and you scrape off the char that you've made until you have a nice deep hole. And this can save you trouble from having to try to burn a hole by mating, the mating process, when you have a piece of hardwood. If this is going to be like a permanent um, pressure hand brace. Okay? So that's one way to do a hole other than drilling or carving. And uh, especially mating for hardwood, right? even though this is just a piece of pine. Okay, more about means and resources. Another thing I don't think I did uh, clarify was that when I was doing uh, like the evening primrose on evening primrose and mullen on mullen and burdock on burdock that the base part which was the split section of the bottom of the stalk usually the the middle of the stalk that side is up so the outside of the the stalk of what would be the base is on the bottom you probably saw that when I was doing it but I didn't actually say it if you didn't catch it because uh, what I think is, is because the uh, base part, because I keep the hollow side up, it's kind of like a, a trough, okay, that runs this way. So the way I see it is this, this trough that runs lengthwise, the spindle sits inside that trough and it, it kind of cradles it that way. If it were to be the opposite way, okay, if it, as soon as it's, uh, first of all, just the mating process alone will eat away all the material that you need uh, in order to get the fire going, and then it's drilling into empty space. So if there's any empty space that needs to be, to go through, it needs to go through that first, and then it needs to be material on material, and I think that's the way it probably should be, right? So if you're using the bottom of a split stalk, the hollow part or the pithy side is always up, 
all right? So that way it fits in there. And of course, it's wider than the diameter of the spindle, okay? Um, always take care of your devices and your tools. They'll take care of you. Try not to do uh, too many shortcuts. Um, I mean, if that's part of your training to see what you can kind of uh, do economically, if you want to call it that, uh, you end up doing that anyway because that's kind of human nature. But in the long run, which you always end up doing though, is you actually start taking more time in your preparations in order to make sure that it's going to go off the first time the correct, the correct way, all the way uh, automatically. So uh, if your bow has a larger end, okay, uh, like if, it's, if this was a branch, um, the end of the branch gets th thinner and smaller, right? While the thicker end that's more toward the trunk of the tree is always thicker. Well, the thicker part of the branch is always, usually always the, the bottom handle that you use for the bow, okay? You don't want the big heavy part sitting all the way out here and having to hold that up. That zaps your energy a little bit. So you always have the thicker part, which should be of a comfortable size in your hand, first of all. That handle should be uh, down where your hand is, okay? All right. The other thing too is, is that there shouldn't be anything really loose on your bow. Like this little tag here, that'll always be like under the hand and that's not going to catch anywhere. But your knots and everything, there shouldn't be anything up here because what happens is, is this goes flying through. You have some kind of piece that goes f flying and flapping. Sometimes that can wrap around your spindle and catch or it'll destroy your coal and you don't want that. You don't want any obstructions. You don't want any obstructions on your bow. You don't want the cord to interfere. But you'll see these things as you go. Okay, but you have to remember to uh, remind student, uh, peop other people about them. Okay, people that are trying to learn this stuff. It's really important. So, uh, pressure hand brace. Now, there are key points to this uh, that you have to kind of always keep in mind. It should always be deeply set where the spindle is never going to escape. Okay, that's always important. It should be always oiled enough along with the brace end that it doesn't heat up ever again. Okay, and as I mentioned just now a little earlier, um, the tip of your brace end should be rounded off and not pointed so that it doesn't start creating a focal point of friction FR friction with your pressure hand brace. Now this one is made of a, a non-burnable material. It is soapstone, okay, so it's not wood, so we wouldn't have that problem anyway. But still, I, I keep that principle in mind where I, I want to reduce friction anyway. This is still lubricated, okay? All right, even though it has a lot of, uh, not a lot of resistance. Um, it should be comfortable. You should be able to get your hand around it and brace it without any issue. Keep it stable. All right. Keep your fingers away from the hole if this is a, a burning material. And keep going with that. All right. Remember that when you're uh, lubricating here at this point with the brace end and the base end that you are doing that oil change thing where you have like a paper towel and you clean out the the grit and uh, it doesn't look so brown anymore and then you add more oil and the oil should look clean all the time okay and there shouldn't be any excess so take care of your devices and uh, they'll take care of you uh, for stability you're gonna have to figure out where you need to wear a shoe or not all right uh, most of the time you probably wear a shoe um, just because it, it'll feel better. But there's sometimes when uh, you just know that the set probably requires that you just should be more barefoot or at least have a sock on or something like that. Too. You should always have some kind of protective footwear on at some point. Okay. And watch you don't burn the arch of your foot or uh, smoke it too badly in that case. So. Um, 
take care of your cord, especially, okay? If you're making natural cordage, if, when, if you're making a set, okay, the cord is always going to be the longest thing to make, especially if you're doing it naturally, okay? Um, so if you're doing natural cordage, really take your time with it, okay? It's, uh, it's really a key device of your five pieces. I mean, it's the thing that really transfers the energy to the spindle. It's what's replacing your hands. So the better quality that you make it, um, the better able you're going to be able to get a call without other issues and having to do it over again and over again. And each time you have to do it again, you're wearing out your cord, you're lessening your chances, you're going to get it anyway because your cord is going to break. All right, so you have to be really careful. Always make sure you have enough cord. So as you can see, there's there's a lot of excess of cord on here, all right? And because uh, you have to keep in mind knots and things like that. One of the way ways you can reduce your need for more cord is to have holes drilled in your um, bow already, all right? And uh, that way you don't need to do any kind of time. You just need a quick knot and run that through and then whatever you have to do down at the bottom end. Um, usually one end, you're always going to need a lot of extra cordage anyway because you're going to need to adjust the tension. This gets too loose, this gets too tight, and you got to make it just right. So you're tying it, untying it, taking it off, putting it back on. That's only natural. It, it's never going to be uh, perfect 100% of the time. So you need to fix it. Uh, you have to adjust it all the time. You have to stay on top of that. So take care of your devices. All right. Uh, remember the height of your notch may require um, some coal extender. In fact, all of your peripherals. You're going to need oil. You need a coal transfer device. You may need coal extender if this is too high to reduce your uh, your need for energy and your duration time. Okay, that you're using to spend to fill that notch. Uh, plus, it gives you once you get a coal, you have an added bonus that your coal is going to last a lot longer because you got a lot more fuel. Okay. The other thing too is if you don't have coal extender, you could just fill that notch halfway with uh, dirt or some other kind of material. Even if you have your uh, little bit of piece of timber bundle, can fit in there. I mean, don't fill the notch all the way. Because you need room, you need a space for the coal dust that you're actually making and the coal ember that's going to pop out of there, it needs a place to go. So this is why I always say fill it halfway because it needs space to fill on its own. You're just, uh, it just doesn't need to fall all the way down to the bottom, the stuff that you're making because it cools down and it takes too long. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, what else we got? Um, in getting materials, I'm showing you a lot of things that you could buy at a store, like the lumber pine, things like that, you know, bamboo. Um, you could also try uh, arts and crafts store. You know, I was, uh, I was just in there looking around, get, trying to get some ideas. And in the arts and crafts store, they have a place where they do um, just for whittling or carving. And they have just blocks of basswood which was really amazing, just large blocks. And, and, uh, and they're pieces that could uh, almost readily be like a pressure hand brace. You can make spindle out of that one. Um, you can cut a whole bunch of bases out of another. It was, it was pretty fun. So, uh, and uh, they have a lot of bamboo there in all different kinds of sizes. They have ones that you could, that were hand drill size, mount drill size, bow drill size, and uh, larger sizes too. And, and you're going to need those for uh, things like fire saw, fire thong later on too. So uh, it's nice to know you can get them pretty much readily available in a lot of places. All right. Um, remember my example earlier? We were doing means and resources and uh, uh, stuff like that uh, when I first originally talked about it. <clears throat> and I took down a willow branch with the reciprocating saw and then I cut it up with the uh, 
uh, clippers and stuff like that. So remember to, when you're gathering materials, be very efficient about it and uh, do everything in kind of a uh, uh, way that everything is just kind of batched together. So if you have a whole branch, just cut out all of your spindles, cut out all of your bases. If there's a bow in there, you know, take that out of there, but get everything all done at once. Don't think you just need one spindle and then just cut that out and just have the branch lying out there. Just do the whole thing and then um, organize everything because you have all your containers that we talked about. So I have all my spindles in one box, I have bases in another box, and uh, they're already there uh, to go for me and they're sitting nice and dry. And uh, if I have a workshop or something, I just pull out the box and we're ready to go. And I have natural materials. I didn't even have to get them from from the uh, hardware store or anything, which is uh, a good experience. Uh, so, oh, and uh, with your spindle, make sure that there's no sidewall friction. So, where your base end meets the base, when this starts drilling down, okay, down into the base hole. You have to be careful that the entire cylinder around here especially, um, the whole spindle should be cylindrical, but especially down here, um, should be really nice and smooth and really, really round because any kind of um, ridges that are going to stick out that are not completely round, it's going to catch the side wall as it goes down and it's going to create friction, FR friction, instead of friction, pH friction, which should be directed to the ring on the bottom. Okay, So what you're going to have is this thing drilling down, and then it's slowing down because the walls are binding around the side as it goes down, which slows it down. That's going to be uh, friction we don't want. So we want friction here, not friction here. Okay, even though it's in the same area. All right, we want to concentrate it here. All right. So our set now, since we're talking about means and resources, I've chosen Ilanthus. And as you can see, I wrote the name. I've identified it uh, around the brace end of our spindle. Okay. And I chose Ilanthus because it's really an invasive a uh, tree um, from Asia and uh, it's just everywhere I mean it's considered a weed tree I mean anywhere that there's a uh, space on the side of the road it really starts growing and taking over in fact it releases a chemical that destroys other plants so that it can grow by itself so there's really no guilt whatsoever in cutting Tree of Heaven or Ilanthus down. And uh, remember, Ilanthus Tree of Heaven is the uh, tree that's in the book, uh, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, because these trees will grow anywhere and everywhere, any little space. And uh, chances are, if you've seen a tree growing somewhere in like the crack of a sidewalk or something like that, it's it might be like Ilanthus or something like that. So uh, for means and resources, use stuff that's really abundant and you really don't have to worry about getting, like bamboo. Bamboo will grow um, crazily, you know, like maniacally, whoever it is. And uh, it just keeps growing and reproducing so you shouldn't feel guilty or feel bad about using it or using as much of it as you possibly can. I know I don't. And plus it's one of my favorites, right? So uh, for that reason, we're doing Ilanthus now. So I've already mated it, okay? I have the notch facing toward you, all right? Uh, for our uh, pressure hand brace, we're gonna do the soap stone. And uh, our card is gonna be our pole transfer device. And I'm gonna get set up. All right, so we're gonna do our Ilanthus. And I'm not going to wear a shoe. Okay. 
Can we string our spindle? I made this really tight. Alright, so we grab that. Start off with, we're going to brace our arm and our leg. Start off with some slow, smooth strokes. And a little bit more speed, more rotations. A little bit more pressure. We got a nice size coal because we created a lot of fuel. So another key thing is the longer you go, the more fuel you can create. So we're going to do our board roll technique. Let's put our extra dust in there. <coughs> the other thing too you got to know <laughs> about Ilanthus is that the, the smoke is really noxious. I mean, don't breathe that in, don't get that in your, in your face, in your eyes, because it's really not good. Not good for any smoke, but Ilanthus seems to be more noxious than, uh, than most. Alright, next.